Hello, my name is Apar Gupta. Over the past decade, I have written more than 150 op-eds across newspapers in India. This has been on thematic areas, on law, technology and its intersection with rights. Quite often, when I have written over this period of time, I have developed my own process, which I want to set out through this video in the hope that it can benefit anybody who is passionate about public policy and wants to bring a greater visibility to their work. So welcome to Amal Talks, and in today's video, I will be telling you how do I write my op-eds and also providing you insights, my own process with the hope that it helps you grow in confidence and also publish more around issues or public policy. I think before we even start and dive into this five-stage process, it is first important for us to ask ourselves three questions. The first is why write? And here you're questioning your own motivation, you're reflecting a little bit. And you're trying to understand whether it's purely a short-term goal, something instrumental, like you want to get a master's admission and you want to get published in two or three newspapers, whether you want to create a little bit more visibility to an academic paper which you wrote, or there is some experience you want to describe. Are you writing for the pure joy of writing? And I think this develops over time. It's not one or the other. What I have noticed in myself is that I enjoy writing for it provides me clarity and the ability to reach out to a wider audience and engage in a public conversation. So it's been this long-term goal, which I think has been more beneficial to me, but to each their own, right? It starts out maybe with a smaller motivation like it did for me for just getting published. And here I come to the second question. Why should I publish? Sometimes we write for ourselves, but an op-ed is essentially entering the sphere of public debate. It is advancing through a publication in a newspaper, a, a greater sense of responsibility through public commentary. And here, I think so there's benefit which accrues to you over a period of time of your professional standing in terms of your networks also becoming much more expansive and recognition of the kind of work which you do. Which brings me to the third question. What is my expertise, experience or identity? So quite often an orbit is a piece of public writing, but it needs to emerge from deeper set of work, which is at your expertise. For instance, I'm a lawyer. I have been involved in constitutional cases on technology. I've been part of public campaigns around greater accountability around technology and rights. So that's my expertise. Hence, I comment on those areas. I don't comment on, let's say, climate change, which is essentially an area which I may be interested in. I may be conversant about, but I may not know a whole deal or may I not have worked on it deeply. So this is expertise and experience. But it can also emerge from a person's identity. For instance, somebody who is from a Dalit Bhujan Adivasi background, who is then commenting on a issue of caste politics, right? So I'm not compartmentalizing these identities towards expertise, but I'm saying that the very basis of the identity is also sometimes a benefit, a, a useful feature of having a voice in a conversation which needs some rights to be heard by the broader public. With all these three questions, I'd just like to say that put very low thresholds and barriers for yourself to start writing. And here I would like to just say what has been my own journey. How did I start? So I started as a blogger on what was called as the Indian Law and Technology blog. And I did this as a student while in law school. And if you notice that writing is terrible, it's not coherent, but I'm trying to do something in which it's a little much more of my own personal take on developments around law and technology with the hope of building an expertise around it, right? And I do this in about 2007, 2008, 2009, and over a period of time accumulate, I think so close to about 300 to 400 blog post entry. So I am regular. The other thing which I do around this time is that I write a legal commentary on the Information Technology Act and I publish it while in law school. While I'm not terribly proud about it, it does fill me with some amount of joy to look back that how when you're young, you can set these big ambitious goals and sometimes achieve them. In addition to that, I've also authored some peer-reviewed articles and I took a course in a master's program on legal scholarship and I recognize that maybe I'm not meant for it. I have worked on these areas as a lawyer. I've litigated them and I've also over a period of time just through my writing developed a substantial body of work. 
the analysis is fresh and sometimes it's presented in a way which possibly advances public debate. It has been published in the Indian Express, Hindu, Times of India, Economic Times, Hindustan Times, Caravan, etc, etc. So a lot of national newspapers, some magazines have published my work over this period of time. I hope on the basis of this, I can explain what is an op-ed and how do I approach it. So firstly, let's deal with the basics. What is an op-ed? An op-ed for short is opposite the editorial page. So it usually sits on pages 8 to 10 of a 20 page newspaper and is written as a prose piece presenting the opinion of the author who is usually not affiliated with the newspaper's editorial board. It needs to be clear and accessible. It needs to engage the public. It needs to be timely. So it should tie in with something people are discussing right there and then. For instance, it should play into a media cycle. If you're talking about, let's say, climate change and air pollution, it would possibly be read by more people, right? If it's published in the winter months, given that in northern India, there's terrible AQI. So it's much more timely. It's much more likely to be read. It should offer a fresh perspective. So it should be novel. And this is where your expertise, your experience or your identity comes into play. And finally, it should be written in plain language. Of course, you can use flowery language, but it's ideal that simple, crisp, modern writing is adopted. Or if you do use certain ornamental features or certain complicated words, they're done with a limited function with a view towards improving the comprehensibility as well as the delight which it causes for a reader. Now, let's come to the five-stage process which I adopt. The first thing which I do is that I develop a pitch. So, you notice something which has come in the newspaper, it's being talked on social media and there's no analysis which is present there and you would like to add that on the basis again of your experience, your expertise, your identity, the kind of deeper work which you do. Okay, it needs to be topical, right? Each newspaper publication is different. For instance, each newspaper has a different style, a different audience. It has a different kind of length. And you discover this usually by being a reader of that same newspaper. For instance, the Times of India has possibly the largest circulation in India. It's widely read by English-speaking metropolitan Indians as a newspaper from which they can get reporting and analysis. But it does not give you that much space. Also, the articles are not written in a policy-ish way. Yet at the same time, if you look at the Indian Express, which has a smaller set of circulation or distribution. It's read possibly in Delhi and some limited metros. Okay, it's readership, values, analysis, and thereby you can add tables, you can use complex statistics and arguments. Yet at the same time, if you look at the Hindu, it has a longer form analysis. It also gets into much more detailed technical conversations, which are not usually tied to an ongoing national controversy. It may be about, let's say, an international trade agreement. So, know the publication to which you are sending the pitch. Okay? And logistics. Whenever you're talking to an editor, be very clear in terms of detailing your expertise, what are your credentials, determine the time by when will you submit, how much space in terms of how many words will you take, and medium, will it be only print or will it also be online? And then stick to it. Or better, send the entire piece in the pitch if you're a first-time author in which you have the pitch, you introduce yourself, you request for space and you attach what you've written at the first instance keeping in mind the word count which is usually carried by the paper. Please do remember that this is a relationship you're developing with the editor and the newspaper and for it to work you have to stick to what you promise and you have to deliver it. This brings me to step two which is to read and reflect. No matter how great you are as an expert, be humble to yourself with regard to your ability. Be clear and refresh on your first principles. Go to the source. So what does this mean? If I'm writing about, let's say, the broadcasting services bill, I will have to read the entire text of the bill, read the Press Information Bureau report, check the ministry's website, which are all primary sources. So... I will be making notes while alongside I'm reading all of these materials and I usually divide it into two columns and I do this in a handwritten form in which I'm first pointing out what are the main features or whatever I'm trying to write about. So it's usually a summary and below that are my ideas, my analysis, what I want to write 
and I usually go back to these notes again and again in addition to the primary documents which I'm commenting upon. So there are basically two columns which separate the summary for the analysis based on the reading and then my thoughts and ideas. It's also important to survey in the field because you're not going to be the only expert who's going to be commenting on the same issue. Usually there'll be three or four op-eds which will be on the same area of public interest and debate which will be published by different newspapers and some pieces may even be published before yours. So remember that in popular writing you need to take the argument forward rather than restate it in different words. You can verbalize it in different words but I think so greater value is served to readers given that a single reader may have a subscription to three or four publications and you're trying to also showcase your own individual expertise experience, your identity and the unique perspective that you bring your own voice to this issue. Finally, be inspired. I think so. We have a tendency in policy writing to combine ourselves to only verbalize it in a very dull and dry form to appear serious. Uh, and I think so. This is a big, big mistake. You have to write with a degree of lateral thinking, which means that you may want to pick up from, let's say, a fiction book which you read recently, a thing which you experienced, a place which you visited. I recommend approaching writing from a point of inspiration rather than anxiety in which these experiences can actually help provide a sense of narrative, something which is a little much more unusual, but at the same time helps tie things together very, very well. The third part is to actually start writing. And here, I cannot emphasize it enough. You need to start writing quick and dirty. You need to start putting words on your Google Doc. Do not go into a well. Remember, you always have the chance of refining what you will write at best from a few hours of step two, which is reading and surveying the uh, basic materials. You will be making an outline and writing. And this is also a very messy process. You may be going to materials alongside and opening more tabs alongside the Google Doc in which you're typing things out. And this is perfectly okay. But there are some code parts to op-ed which are usually useful for you to know in terms of being a beginner. The first is the lead or the news hook, which ties in with what people are discussing right now. So if it's the Uttarkashi tunnel collapse, you will be referring to when it happened, where did it happen, who does it impact. Then you will come to the thesis in terms of what is the issue which is being presented by this news report. And you will set certain context around it if it is necessary, right? You are going to say these are the facts, these are the issues posed by it and this is the context in which now my argument sits. And then you will present your argument possibly with two or three points of support in which you will give your own perspective. For instance, I have used the Uttarkashi Tunnel Collapse, and I'm referring it because it's my most recent op-ed in the Hindu, alongside arguments which emerge from the broadcasting bill in which I say that there's a sense of media contouring. I'm saying that it's not being covered as a disaster in the first place. And then I say that why you don't see it on television is because there's a regulatory system and this regulatory system is now being replicated for the online digital media ecosystem as well through the Broadcasting Services Bill. I'm using a certain degree of context in terms of a new law and I'm setting out my thesis by saying that, well, it's basically bringing a similar form of censorship online. Here, I also think it's very important for us to cite counter evidence when it's necessary. For instance, if the union minister is stating that there are certain defined objectives under which the Broadcasting Services Bill is being introduced, I have to be fair. I have to state it in the analysis. And you can't create a straw man argument in which you reduce the strength of the counter argument or the counter evidence. You have to deal with it honestly. And end is essentially drawing out the conclusion and check for a non sequitur. By non sequitur, I mean that your conclusion does not match your argument. So you have not established it and you have just rushed past and stated what you wanted to say anyway. So it's essentially an argument from prejudice rather than an argument of reasoning. Now I know this is really complex, so let me also tell you some narrative styles I've adopted through the years because a decade is a very long time of op-ed writing and I have written a lot. And over a period of time, I've also gotten bored about 
how I write. It's become predictable just to me. Okay. So given that I do write for pleasure, I have tried out some different things. Sometimes they have worked, sometimes they have not worked. And possibly the style which I have adopted the most because I've also seen other writers use it very effectively. In fact, it's the most popular is what I like to call the one, two, three, in which you first state an argument by breaking it into three parts in which you're very clearly flagging them by saying that first, second, third. This style of breaking the op-ed into three parts usually makes it very easy to write and sometimes I also use it even today. A good example of how I've somewhat used it drawing from different sources of information has been an article on how the Digital Data Protection Act is a form of digital authoritarianism. I've linked to it in this presentation which is also linked below. Okay. The second is a timeline for the reader in which you imagine that a certain period of time, it may be a year, it may be a day, it may be a few hours and you try to give a snapshot of what has happened to the reader. Think about it like a movie, right? An entire day through the eyes of a author, a single person and that being narrated to a, a reader. And I did it in terms of op-ed. I wrote about three events which took place. And there was one central union ministry which was dealing with them, which was a data breach, an event on digital public infrastructure and a press report which came out regarding Jack Dorsey. So it was called the day in the life of mighty, which is the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. The third is an experience based commentary in which you itself were there. And this can be in a first person style narrative. So for instance, I was one of the junior lawyers in the criminal defamation case. And there was a really good anecdote, which then I used in a recent article that I wrote about repealing criminal defamation. You can also coin a face. For instance, I call the digital data protection bill when it was still a property as maybe prescribed law. And this kind of caught on because the law was vague. It provided a lot of powers to the union government to frame rules. And the proposed bill at that time did not have clear criteria how these rules would be made. So I said that everything under this proposal essentially will be decided later and the phrase in the legal text was as may be prescribed. So I said that it's used about 38 times and I also made a table around that and I published that alongside the op-ed. The fifth style which I've adopted but I'm not really fond of is called the contrarian where everyone has a consensus about a public issue. They all agree on it and you come in and you are essentially saying that but you need to think about it and look at it from a very different perspective. And of course, this is also inviting a higher degree of challenge of you establishing your argument. And I did it for ML Sharma when he was interviewed in this documentary around the Nirbhaya gang rape, which is called uh, India's Daughters. And he made uh, several patriarchal as well as misogynistic comments. And people said he should be debarred because of that. I said that there is a risk that you are setting that if you disbar a lawyer for controversial comments which are not determined to be illegal, then it won't also be used against a lot of other lawyers who challenge state authority, who comment on public issues. Quite often, it will be weaponized. Okay. And finally, you can marshal data. You can use a public authority's own data and set it in a frame of analysis. I've done it for COVID um, and all these six op-eds which have narrative styles have been linked in the presentation which is in the description below. So click on them, see what I'm uh, talking about and then come back. With this, I come to the fourth stage, which is possibly the most important stage for me. And this is the editing and the dispatch. And here I first check the narrative structure, which is essentially I read the op-ed again and again. I read it, in fact, also to sound in a way in which I say that, is this sentence sounding well? Is that flowing into the next sentence? So I'm checking the strength of the argument as well as the stylistic elements. And here I need to also break the paragraphs in which I see the last line of the paragraph and the paragraph which follows its first line. So the preceding paragraph's last line and the following paragraph's first line and whether it's linking together, whether there's a chain between both of them. And this is important because the article needs to flow. You need to grab the attention of the reader and provide them an easy way in which between three to five minutes, they're able to read the entire article. And if you make it tougher for them, there's a good chance they may drop off after two to three sentences. Now, you need to read at least five to six times and you need to read it to sound. 
Why I read it to sound is that we also sense language a little much more differently when we read it out aloud. We notice the typos, the grammatical errors, as well as we improve language when we read it out loud to ourselves. Because quite often, if you've written something and you're reading it, the errors are not apparent immediately. Your mind is still fixed into that sentence. And what happens is that quite often, if you read that same article, let's say one week later and there's an error there, you'll notice it immediately. Because at that point in time, you're not reading it as the author of that article. You're reading it as a reader. And what reading out aloud helps you to do is to read your own article as a reader. Cross the basics. Check the word count. Check the grammar. Check the dates which you have mentioned. Each one. Cross check them again and again. Check the events you have mentioned again and again. Given that you may be commenting on a recent event, there may be further news reports which have come out which kind of dispute that. After all, we live in an age of disinformation. So you need to check what you are actually writing about. And you need to be fair in your arguments. Check if your arguments are fair. Okay? Of course, it's really easy to make an extreme point of view, an extreme argument and orbit given that its length is short. But you need to be careful because you're hoping to write over a long period of time. You're hoping to actually build a community of readers who look forward to what you write, what you explain. And this is essentially a facility of trust. Finally, send it to the editor and suggest a title. But don't be held towards it because the newspapers hold a prerogative of the title and the byline in any art. Finally, keep reading. I know this will cause a lot of annoyance to editors and publishers, but till it's published, it's not published. Keep going over the article. In fact, I obsessively read an article and I even sometimes unfortunately update it even after I've made the submission over email. I keep reading it again and again at least for half an hour to 45 minutes after I've sent it. Maybe switching from my laptop to my phone or from my phone to my laptop. The fifth and the final part is to distribute it. Devote two hours for making sure that your work gets read on the morning the newspaper publishes your op-ed. Own your work. You need to build multiple distribution channels. For instance, I publish it on LinkedIn through a screenshot and also linking to the original article. I publish it on Twitter where I have a largish community. Now, of course, you won't be doing all of this. But to some extent, you need to be regular in terms of building that distribution network by yourself. Of course, it will already be published and distributed by a newspaper through its social media, through its print channels, through its digital channels. But you need to also build your own community. In fact, what I've discovered over a period of time is that the criticism as well as the compliments which I receive about anything that I write helps me think about my writing a little much more seriously, helps me improve. And quite often, even when I'm not ready emotionally at that point in time, let's say about five or six years ago, to take a certain form of criticism over a period of time as I've grown into confidence about my writing, I've reflected and that criticism has been helpful. Also accept the compliments. It's really important to feel motivated, feel healthy, but also be careful not to substitute the publication as you build your audience. Okay. And here, I think there are existing practices by a lot of authors. You should look at them in terms of how do they distribute their work without offending the publication, which has chosen them, provided them a platform. So finally, thank your mentors and evangelists. If you build a good, healthy community that people themselves screenshot your articles or post links or talk about them, I think it's really important as much as possible to thank them, to extend a sense of gratitude in which they're devoting their own time as well as being champions of your work. Remember, you're trying to build long-term trust and credibility based on the deep work which you do, not only clicks. And I hope that you enjoy this journey throughout. Finally, I'd just like to emphasize, this is not a masterclass. I am an apprentice. I'm still learning. So start today. Open a blog or a YouTube channel for that matter, right? Even YouTube channels do require a level of writing, right? And maybe that may be a much more effective medium for you. Write regularly and write for yourself first. If it's providing you joy and you do it sustainably, without question, you will become better. And if you think I'm a really bad writer, which is you, the viewer, 
you may also like to think Apar has been a really bad writer or still is a bad writer. I don't know. But just go back to my blog. Okay. Go back to it 10 years ago. And you can see that it is full of mistakes. It's full of analytical gaps. It's full of typos. And it's just terrible. Right. You need to have a greater degree of confidence in yourself than the world may show you. And I hope that you're able to climb that hill. Okay. So have fun when you're writing. I also think if you do not listen, which is that if you do not read books, okay, if you do not read other authors, if you do not read the newspaper, it's much more difficult to write. So you need to listen, okay, not only after you publish an article, but you need to be engaged with your area of work. You need to read a little much more broadly in terms of fiction. You need to be open to experience and then bring it to your writing. Okay, it's cool to have idols. It's cool to have heroes. It's great to have them influence your life, to teach you a new way of what is possible through the English language. Which reminds me of a stump question which is asked to many bands as well as performance artists in terms of who are their influences. So it's cool to have influences. Everyone has them and look and search for them because you will enjoy writing more when you enjoy reading more. So thank you so much for watching and I hope that this video provided you some value, some insights on how I approach writing op-eds. It can possibly motivate you to write more, possibly start your own blog or your own YouTube channel. I've also provided some additional guides and references. The first one is Orwell's Politics of the English Language. The second are Yamni Ayer's op-eds, which I really relish. And I've linked to a muckrack. Uh, link where you can get a lot of the uh, writing and finally there are some class notes from Crystal Lee who's at MIT from Bruce Schneier who's a world famous cryptologist who also writes op-ed and writes a lot of them but also holds a class on how to write op-eds. If you enjoyed this video please do give a comment in the comment section below. I'll really like to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching Amal Talks. till we meet again.